Welcome to Game of Roses. I'm Chad Colchin, aka Bachelor Clues. And today, I'm going to be breaking down the top 10 takeaways from Jen Tran's recently concluded historic season 21 of The Bachelorette. Now, I know it was a rough watch. The After the Final Rose had us all uh, feeling bad for Jen, to say the very least. But it's important to remember that every season that comes out, Bachelor, Bachelorette, Golden, Paradise, Bachelor Pad, Bachelor Winter Games, even Listen to Your Heart, all these seasons have something that they contribute to the broader history of the show. And there were a lot of things that happened in Gen Trans season that I think are worth scrutiny, worth looking at, worth absorbing into the long history of the show. So let's start it out with number 10. The number 10 most important thing that I think happened this season was Paradise is on the horizon again. We saw in the Men Tell All, Hakeem Moulton and Jonathan Johnson got on-screen invitations from Jesse Palmer to come back to Paradise. Now, we know in 2024 there was no Paradise. Season 9 happened in 2023, and it ended in such a disaster with such low ratings, bleeding off about half the numbers that the lead-in show during its airtime, uh, which was Golden Bachelor Season 1. It dropped about half those viewers every week. So I think that was part of the decision why ABC didn't order it for a season 10 in 2024, but they have ordered a season 10 in 2025. And we now know that Hakeem and Jonathan are going to be the first two players, at least on camera, who have been invited. I would assume you can you can bet on Brett Harris if he's not in a relationship and a bunch of other players from this season and, and potentially some from uh, more recent seasons as well. But Paradise is back on the docket. And it was good to see them at least talking about it and getting us excited for it. Now, it remains to be seen if Paradise is going to work in season 10, because in this year that they've taken off, you've seen the rise of Love Island USA season six being the most watched season of that show. And now Paradise has to compete with that and Perfect Match and Too Hot to Handle and all these other shows who essentially do the group dating in a kind of tropical paradise setting format. They do it, in my opinion, way better than Bachelor in Paradise does. So we'll see if they can pick up some pointers from some of these shows and maybe redo the format. We did a whole episode called How to Save Bachelor in Paradise uh, a little while back earlier this year. I encourage everyone to go check that out, listen to it. We have some good ideas in there, I think. Let's move on to number nine. The number nine most important thing that happened this season is it was a season of great villains. Usually we get one villain early in the season, they boot them out. Maybe you get a late season villain and they boot them out. This season had so many villains and they were super entertaining. Sam McKinney, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Boy, I keep the main thing the main thing. I'm gonna continue to keep the main thing the main thing. It's been a minute since we've seen a villain with a great catchphrase like that. I would say Thomas N even had a little bit of a villain edit when he ignored Jen in favor of getting to a fight with another guy <laughs> at one of the after parties. Uh, we have old Aaron Herb giving the condescending uh, self-help book as a present to Devin, a uh, kind of mirroring of what happened to his younger brother, young Noah Herb on Bachelorette season 16, when Bennett Jordan gave him a very similar kind of book in a very similar kind of setting. The ring winner himself, Devin Strader, turned out to be a huge villain. Now, over the course of the season, and this is a late, little bit later on the list, we'll be talking about Devin in more uh, detail, but he wasn't a villain until the end of the season. He was a villain because of post-play, post-season play, but that makes him almost an even bigger villain because he was able to kind of hide his, his true intentions or lack of intentions, however you want to look at that. But I do think these these villains will be remembered. It will be remembered as a season that had a bunch of good villains, fun to watch, say what you will about them in terms of how they played the game or didn't play the game, but they were fantastic villains. Our number eight uh, most important takeaway from Gen Tran's Bachelorette season 21 is, it's the first season Jesse Palmer really stepped into the role, what we call a Game of Roses, a dark lord. It made him, the producers made him ask Jen for consent to roll that footage in the After the Final Rose. Can we watch this uh, back? Do you want to watch back your proposal, Jen? And she says, do I have a choice? And it's in that moment that I think he is crystallized as a person who doesn't actually care about any of the people on the show. This is just a job for him now. He will do whatever is asked of him. And if for those who know their history of, of this show, of The Bachelor, if you think back to season four of The Bachelor, that is when Chris Harrison firmly stepped into that role. I brought four white roses, which means, unfortunately, one of you will be going home tonight. Me. And Bob, you have a decision to make right now. 
that season was historic season four for a lot of reasons it was the first time we saw a male player from a bachelorette season as the bachelor it was the first time we saw kind of like a precursor to a group date rose and it was the first time that we saw chris harrison really kind of enjoying making these players squirm and forcing them basically into highly uncomfortable situations and i think something happens on the bachelor after you've put in about two or three seasons four in chris harrison's case but jesse palmer's around that number as well where you've gone through the cycle of it enough times that initially you do care about these people you do want them to do well find love etc but then it gets to a point where you're like well it's just going to be this same pattern again and again and again and again and this is my life for the next 20 years uh, in a best case scenario. And I think he got to that point last night when he was in that after the final rose, forcing Jen to relive these horrible moments. And, and the order in which they did it was strange too. We'll get to that in a moment. But then also being able to turn on a dime and say, well, Jen, so sorry for your loss. Now let's put our hands together for the golden bachelorette. <laughs> so he became essentially just an emotionless pitch man, just a, a kind of automaton up there doing his robotic work. And I, for one, love that. That means that he is really ready to step into this thing and host it as it should be hosted. Our number seven most important takeaway from this season was the abysmal Instagram numbers. We haven't seen a season like this in modern history. The top five Instagram numbers are as follows. Sam Najad, who was the guy in the rugby game that wore the, the shirt that said Jen's husband and he'd never had a girlfriend before, et cetera, et cetera. That guy has 190,000 followers on Instagram. That is the most of any player in this season. He had most of those followers before he even came into the game. Jonathan Johnson is in second place at 72.2 thousand. Matt Rossi, uh, Jen's ex-boyfriend who tried to crash the season is in third place at 61.1k. All these numbers are, are as of today is Wednesday, September 4th at about three in the afternoon that I'm recording this video. So they may change obviously and will change in the next couple of days. But Matt Rossi right now is in third place at 61.1k. Your incoming bachelor Grant Ellis is in fourth place at 60.1k. Villain of the season, Devin Strader, is in fifth place at 48.7K, and Jen herself only has 336K. I expect Jen's number to rise because she just got cast on Dancing with the Stars, the least they could do for her, in my opinion. Um, but these numbers are all terrible. We've never seen a season this low across the board since the Instagram era began. I would argue back with Andy Dorfman's uh, season 10 of Bachelorette and moving on through all the rest of the seasons up until this point. Let's move on. Our number six most important takeaway from this season was the specter of Maria Georges. We knew that she was supposed to be the bachelorette. They wanted it to go to Daisy. Daisy was in a relationship with a billionaire son. They wanted it to go to, go to Maria. Supposedly Maria shot a few days and was too difficult or the producers didn't like her. I don't know what the reason was. Nobody knows the exact reason except the producers of Maria. But for whatever reason, Maria was ousted. They took her out of that mix and said, you are the bachelorette no longer. And it was kind of a rush job to get Jen in there. So the, the season started with this specter of Maria. Maria went on Call Her Daddy and gave a great interview where she kind of hinted at why the it, it might not have been her, but it was her for a minute. And she was even supposed to make her uh, bachelorette announcement on Call Her Daddy. We learned that in that interview. So that came out before Jen's season. So we already have this idea that Maria is in the mix. Then we go all the way to the group date, the radio station group date, where Sam McKinney brings up Maria by name and said he thought that The Bachelorette was going to be Maria or Daisy. So she's still in the show a little bit. And then we get all the way to the end at the After the Final Rose, where Jen is accusing um, Devin of following Maria after they broke up, after he dumped her basically on a 15 minute phone call. So Maria is the bookend of the season and she is the middle of the season. Even though she wasn't in the season, her spirit was there. Kind of the dark energy of the bachelorette that almost was is just all throughout this season. And it's an interesting, I mean, it's not really a play by her, but it's an interesting thing that has happened as a result of really miscasting or not giving Maria what she wanted or not giving Jen the crown in the first place. It does seem with this kind of advent of Maria being the specter of the season that Jen is an afterthought. It has that little taint to it. And this whole season is tainted. Obviously, we saw what happened in After the Final Rose. Let's move on. 
Number five, the most important, uh, the, mo the fifth most important thing I should say uh, from the season, I believe, is that we got fantastic legacy representation. Now, this is something that Lizzie and I talk about constantly, that The Bachelor, far and away, above all other dating format shows, has a 22-year legacy that they can pull back into and get Trista Sutter to come on the the uh, Yellow Brick Road group date and charity, and they can get all of, you know, Molly and Jason Mesnick to come host that group date. They are the only show that has this much of a history to pull back into. All the other shows are much younger. They Many of them have only 10 seasons or less, so it's harder to get that same kind of legacy that was like, Trista Sutter was here in the early 2000s. She kind of built this franchise on her back. So to see her come out again, and, and uh, all the other players that came out really over the course of the season in, in service of legacy. I thought they did a great job with that credit where credits due. a lot was bad in this season, but there was a lot good. And I hope that they continue to do this legacy play and bring back old players to host group dates. I absolutely love it. Now we move on to our fourth, fourth most important uh, takeaway from the season is Devin Strader himself. Yes, I know he's a villain. I know Bachelor Nation hates his guts right now. However, if we look at what he did in the game, between the lines of the field, sideline to sideline, end zone to end zone, not what he did after the season, but what he did in the season, all the way up to uh, Jen's proposal to him, it was basically a flawless season. And he's a player that I personally did not expect to do as well as he did. I thought that he was going to get caught up in a, a tattle, I thought that he was going to get caught up with some kind of villain rivalry, and he sidestepped all of that in order to win the ring in a season that I think was extremely difficult to play. Again, I'm not casting any judgment, good or bad, on him morally as a person. I don't know the guy, uh, but we, we did see what we saw in that after the final rose, and it seems like he did make some horrible errors postseason, but in the season itself, he essentially played a perfect season, and I don't know that we're going to see something quite like that again he was a, a very singular interesting player and i think he deserves to be in this list because like i said i just don't think a play style like that is going to work again i, I didn't think it was going to work this time and it did he pulled it out just a perfect season turned in by him until the end our number three most important takeaway from this season was the terrible producer decision to make jen watch back her proposal after the hot seat with Devin. Uh, we saw them come out at the beginning of this season, before it aired. The producers did an interview in the LA Times, and they made a huge point of saying, we're going to have our leads back. And, and specifically, they were talking about racial representation in the franchise and how they know it's been bad in the past. They know they failed Matt James, and they're not going to do that to Jen. They're going to represent her properly, et cetera, et cetera. Then we come to the after the final rose decision to make her watch the proposal back after the hot seat. That really is the error to me, that they made her do it after the hot seat. Had they put the proposal where it should have been linearly, just at the end of the regular season, and then come out and had Jen and Devin do their hot seat, everything would have been fine. But it was so brutal to hear Jen say, do I have a choice when Jesse Palmer tries to get consent from her to air this footage? that it felt like they didn't have her back at all. It felt like they did not care about her and they just wanted to see her cry. I don't know what the truth of the matter is. I don't know if Jen knew that they were going to play it and just said that as an offhand. Con I don't know. But what I saw made me feel very bad for her. And it certainly made me feel like this franchise does not have the backs of their leads. It felt like they were torturing her. And I think even they knew it, because if you go back and rewatch, they have Jen's head in the little box. She's watching this, and we're watching her cry as she's watching the proposal go down. The producers at some point recognize we don't want to watch her having a nervous breakdown on set, and they get rid of the whole box. They don't even cut to somebody else watching it. They get rid of the entire box. So I think they probably knew as it was happening, this is not a good idea. And there's obviously a lot of backlash. The Bachelor Nation fourth audience is not happy about this. And they also chose to address none of the things online about Devin Strader and Marcus Schoberger, two finalists, just swept it under the rug. And I think that is, again, going back to the LA Times article, them saying that they are going to look out for their leads, have their backs, address these issues, not ignore them anymore. And then they didn't. They ignored it, and they didn't have their, their leads back in this moment. 
And unfortunately, I think that number three item is probably what this season will be remembered for. But I am choosing to move on from that into our number two and number one things on this list of top 10 takeaways from Jen's season 21. These are the things I will remember this season for. I'm going to try to eliminate the terrible producer decisions. And by the way, if you're Grant Ellis, renegotiate your contract right now as Bachelor. Call them up and say, hey, I saw what you did to Jen. Double my salary or I walk. They've already announced you. They can't. Uh, dismiss you they can't uncast you at this point I think you are kind of in the driver's seat to get whatever you want and I hope you do anyways my number two top 10 takeaway from bachelorette season 21 is Jen was the first Asian bachelorette and the first Asian lead in franchise history now I know it was mishandled we all saw it be mishandled nonetheless she has broken that barrier and overall, I think that's a very good thing for the franchise. It's, it's kind of pulling itself into being contemporary. You don't see problems like this in any other dating show, but you do in Bachelor because uh, it is what it is. And it's good for them to be doing this for sure. And I couldn't be happier that Jen was the person to break this. I thought she was a fantastic Bachelorette. The amount of pressure that was put on her to kind of carry this entire season on her back with a cast of guys that were not there for her, but were cast literally for Maria. I just thought she did a fantastic job and deserves all the credit um, for being the first Asian Bachelorette, which brings me to my number one most important takeaway from this season was Jen Tran is the first Bachelorette to propose to her ring winner. This astounded me. Uh, Lizzie Pace, my co-host here on Game of Roses, predicted this would happen, and she was right. But still, I couldn't believe it when it happened. It is a barrier that I never thought would be broken. And again, in this franchise that is so rooted in just kind of traditional gender norms and what a romantic relationship should be, et cetera, et cetera, Jen chose to defy all of that and, and truly live up to the slogan of this season, which was she's in control and take control and propose and break down that kind of social norm. And for me, that is what I will always remember this season for, that she was the first bachelorette to propose to her ring winner, changing the game forever. And again, Jen Tran, can't thank you enough for the service you put into our beloved game this season. I know this season had some... Uh, some ups and some real big downs. But overall, I think it is historically one of the most important seasons that we have ever seen. And I thank everyone involved for uh, coming on the ride with us to recap it and everything else. But specifically, Jen Tran, thanks to you for turning in an incredible season and much luck in Dancing with the Stars. I hope you take home a mirror ball as well.